Hi, good afternoon or good morning, depending on where you are. And thank you so much for joining today's virtual event, a conversation with author and workforce expert, Rick Wartzman, moderated by Harold Meyerson. So we're really excited to dive into Rick's new book, Still Broke, Walmart's Remarkable Transformation and the Limits of Socially Conscious Capitalism, and get some behind the scenes insights from him with the help of Harold Meyerson, our moderator. Uh, but before we get started, I wanna make sure I give our guests a proper introduction. So welcome, first of all, to our featured guest, Rick Wartzman. Rick is normally on the West Coast, but he joins us today from New York City, same as me with this weather. Um, Rick is the, is the head of the Drucker Institute's KH Moon Center for a Functioning Society and the author of a number of books on work in America. His latest, of course, being Still Broke, which is the main topic of our conversation today. And Evan Osnos from The New Yorker wrote about Still Broke that Rick, the quote, excuse me, Rick Wartzman prov proves once again why he is America's most compelling historian of corporate culture. Still Broke is fair-minded, exacting, and brutally clear that achieving humane wages for frontline workers will take more than good intentions. This should be required reading for every CEO, union leader, and politician in America. So Rick, thank you so much for being here and to give us a special look at your work. Thanks so much for having me. Awesome. And then uh, joining us from Washington, D.C. today is Harold Meyerson. Harold is editor at large of the American Prospect and former weekly columnist for the Washington Post. Harold's articles on politics, labor, the economy, foreign policy, and American culture have appeared in The New Yorker, The Atlantic, The New Republic, The Nation, and The New Statesman, um, among others. And an, Atlant an Atlantic monthly survey has hailed him one of the nation's 50 most influential columnists. So Harold, thank you so much for joining us today and serving as our moderator. And we're, we're really looking forward to your conversation with Nick. It, with it's, Nick. Great to, it's great to be here, Lexi. Great, okay. And I'll just do a brief introduction on myself and, and Steady IQ. So I'm Lexi Gervis. I'm the head of impact at Steady IQ. Uh, for those of you who are less familiar with us, we're the leading source of insight into the 1099 gig and contingent workers that now make up more than one third of the US workforce. Our workflow solutions are used by governments to verify income, our earnings data allow lenders to serve low income non-standard workers, and our financial health data, which we'll talk about today, uh, helps high road employers attract and retain talent. Our data draw on the more than 1.5 billion of enriched financial transactions and 140 billion deposits from 6 million workers who use the SETI app to track and boost their earnings every day. So I'm glad you could all be here today for the conversation and I'd love to get started. Uh, Harold, I'll hand it over to you. Okay, well, thank you again, Lexi. Um, well, this is a real privilege for me because Rick Wartzman is really, I, I think, uh, our time's foremost chronicler and uh, evaluator of, as Evan Osno said, corporate culture, of really what actual big business does in America, uh, good, bad, uh, indifferent, and worse than bad. So with, with that- uh, I'd, never I'd indifferent. Like, <laughs> indeed. Uh, I'd, I'd, I'd like to talk with Rick and, you know, who's looked at business through the lens of uh, looking at Walmart very closely in your, in your terrific new book. Um, I think to the general public, Walmart had, has had a, a mixed reputation, sort of known for low wages, uh, low prices in, over the past half decade or so, Walmart, like a, a number of corporations, has uh, kind of upped its uh, its performance and public relations game in terms of what it's done on the environment, uh, issues such as that, uh, and has uh, been part of the movement to do some improvement uh, when it was under a lot of pressure on uh, on the wage question and and your book kind of dissects uh these these two halves as it were of of Walmart policy it's in in some ways i sort of see it as moving away from its uh, sort of arkansas provincialism uh, to begin with in terms of social policy but not all that far from uh, you know, the, the traditions of this American South when it comes to paying workers and, in fact, influencing the American non-South because of its uh, massive reach across the country. So talk a little bit about that, just sort of summarizing what you found, and then we can get into some particulars. Yeah, no, I think you hit it on the head. I mean, this is kind of a journey story um, from, for the, from the company's standpoint, right? So Walmart, for 
a long, long while was really the most vilified employer in America. I think, you know, the, the height of that you could kind of say was around 2005, 2006, 2007. Harold, as you well know, two, two unions launched separate campaigns that really tried to, you know, turn Walmart into almost a political opponent, right? And they staffed these two campaigns, the SEIU, the Service Employees International Union, and the United Food and Commercial Workers each had these anti-Walmart campaigns that tried to sully Walmart's reputation in the public eye. And, you know, for the food and commercial workers, I think there really was at that point still the goal of softening up Walmart to hopefully, you know, drag them to the bargaining table and to be able to organize Walmart workers and, and collectively bargain at some point. The SEIU really had, you know, that these weren't workers of their jurisdiction. They weren't going to organize Walmart workers. But Andy Stern, then the president of the SEIU, so Walmart is standing for all the worst things of, of, about corporate America its low wages in particular, um, how little health care coverage its workers had and how much they, they struggled uh, in terms of, of, of had, having medical care. And so, you know, both of these unions um, went after Walmart. They were, there were two campaigns. One was uh, called Walmart Watch. The other was Wake Up Walmart. And, and um, they, they were brutal, you know, and so they really did manage to sully Walmart's, you know, the, the, kind of public impression, I think particularly for people who live on the coast and read the New York Times, um, you know, those of us who are privileged, I know many people to this day, I think that reputation lingers and they still won't shop at a Walmart or step foot in a Walmart, even while the Amazon packages pile up outside their door, which is a, maybe an irony to, you know, that, that we don't need to get into right here, but, um, but Walmart, that reputation lingers. But the fact is that they did over time you know, become a more environmentally sustainable company. There's still issues there, but they have gone a long way on that issue. They started to do other things to improve their image and, and take real action, giving food to food banks, billions of pounds of food, lowering the price of prescription drugs, putting healthier foods on their own shelf, winning plaudits from Michelle Obama, right? And her, you know, kind of, you know, try and make America healthier effort. Even President Obama, who said he would never step foot in a Walmart as a candidate, ended up having an event there to tout their kind of environmental and sustainability uh, advances and to talk about his own energy policy. And so they did progress on a lot of issues. Wages was the last one. They just wouldn't budge on wages. And finally, in 2015, for the first time under a new CEO, still the CEO, Doug McMillan, they raised their starting wage across the company. They had never announced a, a higher starting wage increase in one fell swoop across the board till 2015 from their founding in 1962 that had never happened. Their average starting wage at the time was $7.65 an hour. So barely over the federal minimum wage then and unfortunately now still of $7.25 an hour. They had, they had a two-step thing and they raised it to $10 and, and we can talk about what motivated them. There was a range of impulses that, that, you know, that, that were going on there. Well, let's talk about that. And I thought one of the most striking things in your book was when they finally made that decision, which clearly did not come easy to Walmart, um, their stock value tumbled. Uh, you know, this, this became, you know, uh, what Wall Street uh, advisors were telling their clients, uh, "Oh, sell Walmart. This is not how they how they've become this huge, great company that uh, generates profits." And that I think was emblematic of the disproportionate role over the last forty years or so that big finance, high finance, Wall Street plays in the American economy, and how that benefits some people, but doesn't benefit most people. So, so, so let's talk about that particular uh, that particular instance of their yeah. wrenching decision to raise the wage to uh, to ten bucks and its consequences. Yeah. So, so first of all, just yeah, to you know, again, there were there was a lot of pressure that brought them to raise wages, and it had been this you know decade long pressure from unions, other activist groups, most prominently our, our Walmart now United for Respect, which some of of those on the the webinar may be familiar with. Um, right, that it's spun out of the food and commercial workers, which is, continues to put pressure on Walmart on all kinds of issues, including wages to this day. The interfaith community, uh, politicians like Bernie Sanders, uh, journalists, right, you know, pains in the butt like, like you and me, we, you know, right, we, we all were putting pressure on Walmart. 
I think the thing, though, that, that really drove them to change were business operation reasons. And this is important in the context of what happened on Wall Street. New CEO comes in and realizes they had cut labor costs so deeply and had really kind of ground their workers into the, the ground to such an extent that turnover was just becoming untenable. Um, there's a scene where one of their top executives as the new regime comes in under Doug McMillan. She goes into a store and the turnover is 400 percent in that store. And this was not untypical. I heard, you know, the average was up to 200 percent turnover. Retail is high turnover anyway, maybe 65, 70 percent. Um, right. It's a it, typical of kind of, you know, a low paying, you know, business. But but, you know, 200, 400 percent. This was just crazy. And so Doug knew he needed to invest in workers, and, and he made this case to Wall Street that this was a real investment, but Wall Street doesn't take it like that, right? So when Wall Street, they go to make this analyst presentation in the fall of 2015, and somehow they knew this was coming in two steps. So Walmart raised wages to nine, it's starting wage to $9 an hour and then to $10 in this two-step process. It's now at $12. They've continued to raise it some. And, and Wall Street took one look at this and didn't view it as an investment in workers that would raise productivity and cut turnover. You know, those things take time, right? They, they don't kick in immediately. And there began this sell-off when, when Wall Street realized that it, it would depress earnings um, over the next few years until things caught up and hopefully actually improved, uh, you know, income and, and, and earnings over time. And the sell-off was incredible. The stock lost 10% of its value in one day. That was $20 billion of market cap that just went poof like that. They almost halted trading on the New York Stock Exchange because you know things were going so out of control. Um, and I think exactly, it speaks to shareholder primacy, um, the way that shareholders have been elevated over workers, despite all the talk um, from Walmart and many others about stakeholder capitalism, and we can get into that. But yeah, Wall Street, as it often does, this is not untypical. American Airlines raise wages, same thing. The stock plummets. Chipotle raises wages, the stock plummets. It almost, it's like clockwork. Well, you know, I'm struck by the fact that recently in the news, we've had the averted rail worker strike uh, and the bone of contention there was uh, whether they'd get paid sick days. Yeah. Uh, and this was clearly not part of the biz regular business model of, the seven major freight railroads in the country who dominate the industry, and Wall Street was was pretty clear. I mean, they they you know the, the, these have been companies that are rewarding shareholders uh, quite handsomely. That they didn't want the fundamental business model to change, and this became, I think, kind of a symbol of uh, whether that business model would weaken. Uh, and 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 so I think we. Uh, we do see that. Uh, so in, in terms of this, you know, corporate responsibility, there was the business roundtable put out uh, a, a new mission statement several years ago saying, well, now we are as concerned with all the stakeholders uh, rather than just the shareholders. And, you know, back in the good old days of mid 20th century, uh, these companies did say we are concerned about stakeholders. Um, you look at some quotes from executives at General Electric and other places saying we want to keep our workers through their lifetime. We, the notion of having two to four hundred percent turnover in a year was like completely alien to them. Um, and we want to be good citizens. Uh, we're locally based. We want to support the little league team, so on and so on. And that was replaced uh, by a doctrine that sort of trickled down, as it were, from Milton Friedman, that all you really should, you know, concern yourself with is shareholder value. So the business roundtable said, okay, we're switching from that. And, uh, you know, some companies like Walmart have become much better on environmental issues, on sustainability issues. But in terms of really stakeholder capitalism, like the Germans putting workers on their corporate boards or just having your workers represented through collective bargaining, we haven't seen much of that. In fact, in general, we haven't seen any of that. I mean, you and Walmart is, is very emblematic of that. I, I think it really is emblematic, and and I and I think here's where we are. So, first of all, yeah, you 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 put it perfectly right. Before you know, we started calling things stakeholder capitalism. It was just known as capitalism back yeah. in the three decades after World War II, and now it's stakeholder capitalism or conscious capitalism or shared value. Right, all these different uh, you know kind of terms that that business has taken on. And look, it's real to some extent, and I think Walmart is a great example. So. 
from 2015, when they made that first uh, wage increase, starting wage increase, to the end of 2021, it invested five to six billion dollars in higher wages, improved training. They've moved their scheduling to more full timers, from part timers to, to enhance their stability, um, and and that's great. Um, other, they've improved healthcare benefits and so on, created more career pathways. Five to six billion dollars in those investments—that's real money. Over that same period, they've bought back $43 billion worth of their stock, um, which is, you know, there are many reasons companies buy back shares, but one really is to, you know, boost share price, try and boost share price. And it is seen as, you know, as a, as a sop to investors, right? And so, you know, when you look at that, you say, is stakeholder capitalism a real thing? Well, yes, five to six billion dollars is real. And again, I'm saying this in the context of Walmart being emblematic of the broader, you know, kind of landscape of corporate America. But is shareholder primacy dead? You know, we're journalists, right? We just follow the money. And so you say <laughs> five to six billion here and 43 billion here. Both are true. And I think what's happened is that the rhetoric around stakeholder capitalism has just outrun the reality of it. You know, these companies drink a lot of their own Kool-Aid. And I think they genuinely think they're doing better than they are for their frontline workers. I, I think there's a real distance, you know, in, in terms of the lived experience of those in the C-suite. And look, all of us who are privileged and, and don't struggle and the tens of millions of Americans who really do struggle to make ends meet, working Americans who struggle, um, there's a real gap you know, we, we need a TV show called Undercover Boss, right, for people to go and actually the bosses to see what the lived experience of their frontline workers is like. I mean, think how messed up that is. Exactly. And, you know, it was uh, 50 years ago this year, no, 60 years ago this year that Michael Harrington's book, The Other American, Other, yeah. came out, whose sort of an opening premise was that poverty in the United States has become largely invisible. Now, what's changed since then is working poverty in the United States has become largely invisible. I mean, we don't really focus on the people who work at Walmart. Uh, and we're, we're kind of dimly aware of this thing called share buybacks, which again is reflected, as I said, in the, in, in the railroad industry. Those companies over the last decade spent $196 billion on uh, share buybacks and dividends, and significantly less uh, on what what they spent on maintaining uh, uh, train tracks and trains. So you you have this as a constant uh, throughout big corporate America, of which Walmart is is emblematic. So it, near the conclusion of your book, you talk about you sort of your evolving views as to what kind of necessary social change uh, we have to have to bring workers up to really livable standards in their lives, and a sense that corporations aren't going to be the agent of that and we really do have to look at government that's one of your one of your conclusions in 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 the book so if you could talk about that for a bit yeah a absolutely so right this is where i land so in my last book before this one the end of loyalty the rise and fall of good jobs in america you know i've always been a both end person right i think that you know i've always said look government has a role to play business has a role to play in ensuring that you know, all workers earn a decent living. And, but I, I was more in the, you know, business camp side of that. If I had an emphasis, it was on business needs to kind of create a sturdier social contract between its workers, uh, you know, and, and the company as it had in the three decades following World War II, that government was there to, you know, set regulation and set the guardrails and a safety net for, people when things really got tough, but, you know, business was going to have to really solve this. And what, you know, my, my, my deep look into Walmart has caused me to reconsider. And, and it's precisely because, you know, Walmart isn't evil. It, it's because this is what good in America has come to look like. You know, this is where good enough, right? Walmart raises wages to $10 an hour and they're hailed now on fortunes change the world list, right? They're changing the world. And, and in some ways, again, I, I applaud them in the book. It's great. They've made this turn. Five to $6 billion is real investments. But when all is said and done, after all this pressure on Walmart, after a lot of soul searching, after real change, it is the, the subtitle of the book. I didn't compose casually, right? Walmart's remarkable transformation. In the context of its history, it's been real. But at the end of the day, the average Walmart worker still makes less than $29,000 a year. 
That's not a living wage anywhere in America. And so this has shown me that when you have a company that's really trying, they still are playing within this, this system, their own kind of corporate system, their own business model, the larger societal system that we've created over the last 50 years, the norms we've created. Corporate America will never move far enough, fast enough on its own. And so I call at the end of the book, it's really a full-throated cry for a $20 an hour government mandated living wage. And we can talk about why $20, but, you know, and that sounds crazy or radical to people, but I really believe that's where we need to get. Well, in, in California, where you live, Rick, uh, the state minimum wage has gone over $15 an hour. So right. it sounds crazy, only depending on where you live to a certain degree. But right. since, since you raised the question, okay, why 20? Yeah, so $20 an hour comes from um, the calculations of a, of a group that is actually working with companies, um, now a few larger companies, but mostly you know smaller to mid-sized businesses, group called Living Wage for Us. Um, it's spun out of Oxfam America, um, and uh, they've done a lot of calculations with our friends at the Economic Policy Institute to really look at what constitutes a living wage county by county in America. It's a bit like the MIT living wage calculator. People are a bit more familiar with that. But what I like about the living wage for us standard is it looks, it's one number, right? So it's not a range of numbers. If you're single or if you have one dependent, which all which can be kind of confusing, especially as a business. Well, which do we do? We have workers in all these categories. This adheres to an international standard that says we should have a family living wage. And what that means is what would it take for, in, in the, what's the typical size working family? In America, it's actually um, two adults, two kids, the adults work one and three quarters sort of full-time hours. Um, that is the, you know, the actual statistical definition of a working family in America. And what would it take to support that working family? In 80% of counties in America, or I should say 80% of Americans live in counties where the living wage, the family living wage, which is this accepted international standard, uh, makes $20 an hour or more. 40% of Americans live in counties where it's $25 or more. Yeah. And in California, if we're following yeah. the strike of the teaching assistants and research assistant grad students at the yeah. University of California, of whom there are 36,000 out of 48,000 yes. on strike, it, it you know, these these tour workers who are making in the mid $20,000 a year in, in a state where that will take uh, all of that has to go to your housing, and it probably still isn't enough for that. So, uh, uh, you know, situations that have just settled in, even in a as so basically liberal a state as California, it is simply uh, hard for a lot of uh, uh, people who are well off to imagine the struggles uh, that uh, the working class and even the future academic leaders of America have to uh, put in day a day after day to just to uh, just to survive. Um, so one of the things the government uh, would have to do, and I'm going to, we should do this fairly quickly because we want to go to, to Lexi in a couple of minutes, yep. um, is make it possible for workers to actually form and join unions again. That has been yep. uh, increasingly difficult ever since the early 1980s because the, the labor law, which presumably protects workers who do that, has become a, a piece of Swiss cheese where the holes are bigger than the cheese. Um, so talk a little about that, what that would require. Yeah, again, I, you know, I point to the need for a living wage above everything else. I think getting money into workers' pockets. And look, you can do it through, you know, pre-distribution, if you will, or redistribution. I kind of call for pre-distribution, putting it on companies to, to put more money directly into people's pockets, to, to have a living wage, a wage where working people can, can live decently. Um, but I also think that we need to bolster that, you know, with other things, like the earned income tax credit, you know, and 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 other, you know, kind of redistributive policies as well. And then, yes, you know, we need more worker voice and power. And so, um, you know, I, again, this I am a both end guy here. I, I think some things like the PRO Act and strengthening collective bargaining, uh, you know, would be really important. I also think we need new models and new forms that are more applicable to the 21st century, um, you know, sectoral bargaining comes up a lot. I think that could be really powerful. 
And, you know, in the great, you know, nation of California, right, we just, you know, pass something that is not quite sectoral bargaining, but moves in that direction very much. And with, you know, this fat idea of a fast food council that would have representatives of labor and, uh, you know, and business and, and others in this case, and that could raise wages as high as $22 an hour for fast food workers, as well as set, right, working standards across that industry. And, you know, not surprisingly, just yesterday, the, uh, you know, coalition of, of restaurants, uh, you know, submitted to the Secretary of State enough signatures to put a ballot measure that would overturn the law that was just passed creating this, this sectoral bargaining council. And, and so, you know, I think what that tells us is labor, labor is having a bit of a resurgence, has had it in 2022, we see it at Starbucks and Amazon and so on, the number of petitions to, to organize at different companies file with the NLRB, but we should not underestimate the fierce resistance that companies will offer, particularly in, in, when it comes to organizing. And that is a more a distinguishing feature of American capitalism than it is in uh, the capitalism of Europe and, uh, and, and, and other places as well. This is, uh, I've, I've often thought that it's the US and China, which are um, the major nations most opposed to uh, genuinely powerful worker organizations. Right. So, uh, which is really, which is, yeah. is, is democracy, right? That's really yeah. what it is. It yeah. is workplace democracy. Yes, yes, which which, by and large, uh, American workers do not have. Well, speaking of American workers, uh, are the organization sponsoring uh, uh, my talk with you, uh, mm -hmm. Steady IQ, has more data uh, on on those workers and on Walmart workers in particular uh, than anyone, with the possible exception of Walmart. Uh, and uh, unlike Walmart, we. we they're eager to share, uh, <laughs> eager to share that data. So, so Lexi, wh what what do you have in terms of what, and how did you get it in terms of what uh, real large numbers of real Walmart workers uh, are making and able to save and things like that? Thank you, Harold. Yeah, the conversation was so interesting. Um, as you mentioned, we have data that comes from the six million members that we have on our app who link their accounts where they earn income. So we actually have insight into the employers that they're earning from, how much they're earning, as well as their financial health and markers of financial health. Uh, so we have about 300,000 Walmart workers on our platform. I actually pulled, to prepare for this, I pulled a, a subset of the data for about 50,000 workers who were you know, reliably working at Walmart for a long time so that we could you know, say something confidently. And I think to your point, Rick, about you know the the strides that Walmart have made is not enough is, is really clear in, in some of these data. So for example, uh, 40 for, of, our, of the Walmart workers on our, our platform, 68% of these workers are using payday loans. So that's typically a marker that their income coming in is not enough, right? Because they need to be accessing that income before and potentially paying really high interest rates right. in order to do so, right? So that means the wage itself is, is not enough to begin with. Um, they also had $41 more in expenses a month than income. So that means that they're actually coming out, you know, 3% in the red every month. So not, you know, earning earning that much less actually than, than, they, than they need to spend each month to get by. Um, we also saw that 61% incur bank fees. So this can happen, you know, from overdrafting and the money in the account not being enough. Um, and then we saw that on average, they have $25 in their savings accounts, $25, excuse me, in savings in their accounts. So, you know, obviously this is a, a, a month to month paycheck to paycheck existence and clear there's not, there's not any wiggle room there. And, and, you know, things like saving for retirement, uh, being able to own homes, right. Putting towards things that build wealth, we know generationally are, are not possible on, on those kinds of wages. Yeah. And this, yeah, I was just going to say, I mean, this plays out of course, right. Walmart's the biggest employer in America, but this is emblematic of, again, what I describe as a wage crisis. So, you know, depending on how you measure it, somewhere between 25 to 40% of the labor force, that's 40 million to 65 million working people are in the kind of boat, and I, I bet your data would support that, that, right, that you, you just shared for, for these 50,000 Walmart workers. And, you know, Again, step back and think about what that means. If you have twenty five dollars in your savings account, or you know, you're you're just struggling in this way, right? 
we know this, your, your, the tolerances in your life are so tight. One thing goes wrong and you spiral into crisis. Right. And we see this played out in the data. So, you know, a third of people who go to food banks, you know, come from a household where somebody's working, right? Again, these are not the unemployed, you know, made the unemployed or they've dropped out of the labor force or they're lazy or whatever, you know, pejoratives are thrown their way. These are working folks who, who for the most part, get up, you know, and work hard every day. 40% of homeless people, right, who, you know, are in shelters, 50% of those on the streets, there's data that shows they were employed at some point during the year in which they find themselves living under these conditions, which suggests to me that homelessness is not just, you know, about mental health issues and addiction, but it's just about work that doesn't pay people enough. Right. And and we know that some of those University of California grad students uh, yeah. who are teaching assistants to the next generation of America's leaders live in their cars, for God's right. sake. So, you know, uh, the, 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 this the, the definition of the barely paid working class is very expansive and includes tens of millions of workers of all kinds uh, in this country. And, and some of those workers of all kinds are gig workers, or temp workers, uh, part of the destandardization of employment that we've seen over the last uh, several decades. And you, you have some information on that too, Lexi, right? Yes, yes. And I'll jump into that one second. I just wanted to follow yeah. up on one thing that, that Rick said there about um, th how close you are away to that kind of emergency, right? Where you're, where you're not, you know, ending up homeless or anything like that. We see the same thing with our emergency cash grant and guaranteed income work, right? It's often seen that giving people money is what, what prevents people from working, right? But the opposite is always true. So giving people the money that you need to stabilize your income is actually what enables people to work more, right? So giving emergency cash grants helps prevent financial emergencies from becoming cascading emergencies. So you can get your car fixed, right? So you can continue to go to work or if work is your car, right? If you're an Uber driver, right? You have, you have your workplace. Um, we see the same thing with guaranteed income work, receiving, you know, we host a lot of guaranteed income programs on our platform and receiving monthly floor stabilizers of income actually enables people, actually increases people's earned income overall by, by the end of the program. We have some initial data on that. So, you know, having that floor doesn't make you stop working. It actually enables you to work. And I think that's- I would, I would imagine that pertains particularly to, to two parts of, uh, uh, the Biden program, which either didn't pass or were there temporarily, that being the child tax credit and uh, aid for uh, child care, which obviously would create a more stable workforce in addition to much else. But it's, you know, that proved a bridge too far for a divided Congress. Can I, yeah, well, yeah. I want to add one other thing here. I think, Leslie, when you talk about emergency, you know, sort of funds and and the ability to tap those, you know, which is which is great. I, I did an event last night with um with Abigail Disney, Abby Disney, who has this wonderful new documentary out called The American Dream and Other Fairy Tales about right frontline Disney workers who again are living like you know many Walmart workers and many other frontline workers, right? And and so you know she made a great point, which is that Americans tend to be super generous. So the hurricane strikes, right? And and they will we will do everything we can and we pour relief in because those people are in crisis. And yet when they you know when they live it day to day, right. as Harold said, they disappear. It becomes invisible and we stop seeing that this is a daily crisis. It's not just the hurricane or you know the other thing like that that we you know we'll 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 all get you know dig into our wallets and provide for um, this is a daily crisis for tens of millions of folk yeah we don't means test after a hurricane uh, That's right. but we means test uh you know for for other government benefits because presumably it's your fault uh you know that that you're in this fix and one of the things you get into your book uh, about Rick is uh, the, the, the deliberate conflation of low wage workers with low skilled workers, and that there really isn't much of a correlation there other than that lo low skilled is kind of a, a justification that's created right. to uh, uh, paint over the flaws of low wage. Yeah. And it, as if all jobs don't take skill. Too. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and I will just say this: we're we're huge proponents of the CTC. We we were actually also able to see in our data who would receive the you know enhanced CTC last year, and all the markers were 
extremely positive. Like we had, we saw a huge decrease in overdraft fees in the months where families were receiving the CTC, uh, a reduction in reliance on credit card spend. So people weren't needing to overextend themselves because they actually had the money in their accounts to pay for what they needed. So um, there's a big week of action right now around the CTC and it's something we're highly supportive of. Okay, okay. And I, I had mentioned earlier, yeah. Lexi, that you, you guys also have a lot of uh, a lot of data and a lot of insights on the growing trend in the United States to, <laughs> while you're actually employing a worker, denying that you're really employing and that they're independent contractors and things like that. And what can you tell us about that? Because this is like, you know, the new wrinkle on an already bad situation for, for low, low income workers. Yeah, and I think it's really related to the dynamics that Rick talks about in his book, right? So, you know, we see the the we see spikes in we call it non-standard works that includes gig workers, contingent workers, 1099 workers, temporary workers, seasonal workers, right? That kind of broad um umbrella. Right of all those who are working outside of a traditional full-time W-2 contract with an employer. And, you know, we see that the that kind of work spikes in a recession, right? So it, it spiked in the 2008 recession and then it spiked again in the pandemic. And that's because as people lose their jobs, they can quickly pick up that kind of work, right? To potentially, to potentially you know, be a stopgap. But I think the overall rise in this kind of work is speaking to the fact that wages aren't paying enough, right? So if, if workers' jobs you know, we're paying enough to begin with. And I, I think we have a question for the audience, so we'll get to it in one second. Um, if, if wages workers, if wages workers were enough to begin with, we might not see so many people picking up this kind of non-standard work to fill the gap, right? So, you know, we saw during the pandemic, we looked at people who had W-2 income, lost the job and received pandemic, you know, unemployment. 80% of those people picked up a 10 a job at some point, right, mm -hmm. in, in that period. But then we see them continuing to pick that up as inflation goes up, right? It becomes a stopgap. You can pick up that type of work. I think as you, you know, Rick, you were speaking about scheduling. As you're scheduled, you know, you're not given enough hours a week to work. You're going to have to pick up that type of work. Um, you know, if if your expenses go up because of inflation, as said, you might be making ends meet with this. So I think we see, you know, one part of the. I think there's other factors and mechanisms at play that are, you know, making this kind of work grow so much. But I think one part of it is definitely to do with wages not being enough. And I think what's what's controversial or problematic about that is people could be working full-time jobs and then having to pick up this work afterwards, right? And I, you know, then you can't enforce overtime pay and, and make sure if someone's, you know, not working too many hours, right? Like we, we believe, I think, as a society that everyone should have time off of work. So I think when wages aren't enough and people are having to pick up other streams to make that work, you know, we are potentially um, putting workers in a position that that's not sustainable. Well, we're eroding family life, basically, yeah. uh, which presumably shouldn't happen in the land of the free and the home of the brave. So, uh, there, Lexi, do you do you have a question? I can I can read in? the yeah I can read the question from from one of our attendees. Um, I believe unions had their run during the '80s, maybe a little further, but unions are a force that also operates as a company. Um, and profits from those that they are helping. So the union itself. So it's as cyclical as when operations expenses go up and prices increase. Are there other labor models or solutions that corporate America could do, but the middle-class workers won't feel they're subsidizing others to not do their fair share for the solution? I don't know that the middle-class fears that. The latest uh, Gallup poll on yeah. the approval rating of unions has it at 71%, yeah. which is higher than it's been at any time in the 1960s. Look, unions are human institutions and they have flaws, just like corporations, but there hasn't been a war to abolish corporations as there has been a war to abolish unions over the last uh, 40 some years, uh, you know, and the one, uh, the really only period of union strength in American history, which is the three decades after the 1945 end of World War II, also is coincidentally, but not really coincidentally, the only period in American history when we approached anything like broadly shared prosperity, when a decent percentage of Americans had a living wage. So that, that that's my two cents on that. Rick, do you want to uh, chime yeah, in? Yeah, I just, I just add a couple quick things in, in the closing minutes here. So, you know, one, it's important to remember the private sector unionization rate in this country after this war of which Harold, you know, speaks uh, is down to, you know, about 6% of the private sector workforce is now unionized. This is down from, uh, you know, over 35% in the 1950s. And, you know, it's just been on a, on a steady and exorable decline. Um, 
Some of this is because of unions own missteps for sure, from scandal to lack of innovation and, and lack of organizing. Uh, but most of it, we shouldn't kid ourselves, has been because corporate America has done whatever it has taken. And this is really a Walmart playbook to they've done whatever it's taken to beat back organized labor through means both legal and illegal. And they have decided that whatever costs they're going to pay in terms of you know, fines from the National Labor Relations Board or things like that are minuscule compared to what it would mean if they were brought to the bargaining table and actually had to hammer out a contract with, uh, you know, a, a collective group of workers. And, and so, um, you know, once you, what's important is when you get to about 20, 25% of workers being, private sector workers being organized, the data shows, that actually helps lift the boat for everybody. Right. Suddenly, right, there's this spillover effect that scholars speak of where even non-union companies have to raise wages and improve benefits to compete. So I, I think it's really important. But yes, there also are other models. And, you know, labor law doesn't really allow for worker councils at companies, ways for workers to have more voice on the job. And this is another area where labor law needs to be reformed to allow for more innovation, more, more imagination, more ways that workers who really care about their companies and, and want to see their companies thrive can contribute in, in more ways. Rick, thank you. We, we have one more um comment from the audience. I just thought we, we could comment. And it says, please comment on UBI in the context of, of a living wage. So universal basic income in, in the context of what you were proposing for living wage. I'm happy to weigh in too, but love you to take that first. I'll, I'll go super quick. I'm, I'm not a huge UBI fan all in all, though I love many of the people behind it. And, and I'm more in favor of expanding the earned income tax credit. I, I think it's more efficient. Um, uh, anyway, I'll, I'll leave it there. And I agree totally with Rick, so I'll leave it there. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Yeah, I mean, we, we're, we're proponents of, of guaranteed income um, in general, but I think to your point, it's about who's taking the who's taking the responsibility for making sure that workers have enough, right? Have enough money coming out at the end of the day. I think it sounds like in your book, you lost hope that it's coming from the corporation themselves, right? And we're relying on government mechanisms to do so. So I think yeah. that's one potential government mechanism through yeah. which th this could happen. Okay, well, I think we are at time. Uh, so I want to thank Rick and I want to thank Lexi. And I should, uh, I want to recommend again Rick's terrific book here, Visual Aid, uh, <laughs> Still Broke Walmart's Remarkable Transformation and the Limits of Socially Conscious Capitalism. Uh, holidays are coming up. It's either a gift or a good way to spend time when you've uh, had enough time with your family. So I'm I very much a both end guy on that. So yeah. yeah. Okay, good. Good. All right. Well, thank you all. <laughs> Let me take a moment just to thank yeah. Harold and Rick and also all of our attendees. And we'll follow up with an email actually with the recording of this. So you can share it with colleagues if you want to. Please reach out to us if you have questions or you want to continue the conversation. We love conversations like this and we love sharing insights from, from our data and, and using it for good. So please get in touch uh, and we look forward to seeing you.